the people of China, the dragon is the symbol of freedom. As it flies skyward, it releases man's spirit from earthbound actions and makes it one with nature. Through 5,000 years, since they first cast bronze in the Yellow River Valley, the Chinese people have practiced three great virtues. These they have expressed in their art. These have enabled them to fight and survive, for they tell that the individual is nothing, the people everything. Order is the first of these beliefs. Complete form, complete discipline. Divine pity is the second faith. From Kuan Yin, the Buddhist goddess of mercy, has come the belief in humanism, in the strong ties of good neighborhood. Do not unto others what you would not have others do unto you, said Confucius. Within the four seas, all are brothers. We see man in his right perspective. The hermit gazing at the mountains and the waterfall sums up the true place of man in the scheme of things. The third of these beliefs is the warrior spirit, strong in Chinese hearts from the dawn of time along the Yellow River to the great nation which today struggles for the realization of China's destiny. That spirit sums up 50 centuries of national prowess. Through this spirit, China has always been able to repulse or absorb those who sought dominion over the vast mystery of her land. In 5,000 years, she absorbed successive invasions. The men of Turkestan, moving eastward past the Pamirs and the Hindu Kush, The Tatars surging over the open plains to the north of the Altais and down into Shantung. The Mongols and the Manchus. And in recent times, the Japanese, who knifed and prodded the body of China and spread their dominion over great areas of her rich land. All these came to conquer and were beaten back or absorbed. China was strong and cultured when her neighbors were little more than savages. The Chinese had a system of organized self-government and a cultural heritage in the days of the Great Yu, almost 5,000 years ago in the valley of the Yellow River in the times of the Xia dynasty, before even the Great Wall was built. Today in Canada, the Royal Ontario Museum contains one of the finest collections of Chinese art in America. Here one may read the story of the art of China from the earliest times. Her written tongue was first inscribed on bone. Here she developed a universal written language for 400 million people and a sureness of hand for fashioning works of art. Today in the great dikes by the river, we still find the ancient pottery, hand turned from the yellow earth and of exquisite shape. The Chinese never thought of art as a thing apart. It grew from skilled fingers and sensitive minds working on objects of usefulness. The bronze cooking pot, three-legged to boil quickly on the desert fire. Ceremonial knives and ladles for festival wine. The bronze horse jingle that sounded across the plains of Honan and Chaha as the horses galloped to the hunt richly decorated with turquoise and jade. In the days of the Shang, nearly 4,000 years ago, the Chinese people created the finest bronze work in the history of mankind. Their bronze found a place also in mechanical objects, connectors to link the timber beams of a house. Ingenious knock-down assemblies for holding up ceremonial awnings against the summer sun. Even in this early time, the Chinese people revered the past as real and alive. They worshipped their ancestors as great men whose works still lived.
to the great tombs, which still rise like huge sentinels on the ancient landscape of the Huang Ho River, go the remains of earthly life. Here they receive the homage of generations of sons. They lie beneath the guardians of the eastern and western gates, carved in soft limestone. Into the tombs go carvings of the animals men lived with. These the Chinese have always loved, in the spirit that sets men on a level with all creatures. In pottery, bare or covered with rich glaze, and later in cast iron during the Han and Wei dynasties at the time of the birth of Christ, the craftsman created the creatures he knew. He turned their shapes into objects of ornament and of use. His lamps filled with oil burning long wicks in the back of a sheep or the mouth of a phoenix. In the candle tree lamp, the artistry of the Chinese bronze maker finds its highest point. Each lamp represents one of the ten suns that one day all rose together, scorching the earth with their heat. But the heavenly archer, with his unerring arrows, put out all save one, the one we know. Chinese civilization grew both graceful and strong, and by the second century AD, a vast centralized culture stretched from the shores of the Yellow Sea westward to Samarkand on the crossroads leading to the Roman Empire, and from the headwaters of the Lena River south to the confines of Burma and Siam. In the third century, the image of Buddha crossed the Himalayas to challenge the order of Confucius with belief in the fleeting quality of life. With Buddha came his attendants, the Buddha Sivatas, guardians of both happiness and sorrow and his earthly disciples, the Lohan, painted in brilliant glazes by the potters of Yinan and Kyangsi to the south. On the walls of the Buddhist temples and monasteries, which arose along the valley of the Yangtze, in the hills of Shizvan and the plains confronting the China Sea, Chinese craftsmen painted their new found faith. Buddha, divine and transfigured with tender pity, his foot planted in the sacred lotus. Yet the Chinese craftsmen preserved the warrior tradition. And during the Tang Dynasty, at the time of Europe's Dark Ages, his art burst out with surpassing vitality. Often legend tells of horses so charged with life that they galloped away from painter and potter alike. The Chinese Empire expanded constantly westward in the 300 years of the Tang Dynasty, and Chinese artists reflected its growing brilliance and its growing strength. The twin-humped Bactrian camels yearly led the silk trains over the long route through the Gobi Desert to Smyrna and back across the steppes of Kwarakum to the valley of the Yangtze. Village life was vigorous with competitions and games. And in the courts of the city and country houses, a new graciousness came into everyday life. This was the glory of the Tang. Order once again added a cold fire to Chinese art in the days of the Song Dynasty, about the time Leif Erikson sailed westward to North America. Into the superb shapes and the rich glazes of bowls, vases and pots, there came a cool aloofness that spoke of a deep and complete sense of form. According to ancient Taoist philosophy and its belief in the complete identity of man with the rhythm of nature, the soul merged with the wind, with the clouds and the mountains and the waterfalls. And the energy of the soul, fluid and penetrating, took form in a symbolic dragon. Again on the walls of temples and public buildings, the long line of Taoist deities spread out in endless procession, 
painted in soft tempera and watercolors on the surfaces of plaster and limestone. Through Taoism, man understood the unity of the universe. He recognized the kinship between his own life and the life of animals and birds. Man is lord of the world, but only because he has gone out into humbler lives than his own and has understood them. This attitude penetrates all the arts of the Chinese people. Canada, a young country creating her own philosophy and culture, has taken to herself these images of an older land. By studying them, we learn to look upon China and the Chinese people with new understanding and respect. To all Chinese people, the men who sit in judgment in the towns and villages, the peasant mother with her child, the gardener who drives off evil spirits, to all is common the feeling of humility before the creatures of nature. To all is common the deep humanism that comes from the Buddhist teachings. The Chinese people today are taking their place among those nations which seek to spread a universal concept of man's freedom and dignity. Such a concept is in accord with China's history, her culture and her arts, which are China's glory. The dragon, symbol of freedom, again symbolizes China's aspirations for herself and her hope for all the peoples of the world.